Mike is a 26-year-old man who has lived with paralysis of part of his right arm since birth. He has little power in his right arm and most of the time it is kept slightly internally rotated and extended with the forearm pronated and wrist flexed. He also has reduced sensation over the lateral aspect of this arm. Mike is suffering from a condition known as Herb's palsy, which results from damage to the upper part of his brachial plexus. My name's Connor, and in the next six minutes, we're going to cover everything about the brachial plexus and work out what's happened to Mike. The brachial plexus is a network of nerves that arise in the cervical spine and travel down into the axilla and eventually the arm, providing motor and sensory supply to most structures from the shoulder downwards. Taking a first look at the brachial plexus can initially be quite daunting due to the sheer number of anatomical relations and the seemingly complex branching and joining pattern it follows. But don't worry, I'll break it down into manageable parts. First, let's take a look at the bony relations of the brachial plexus. To start with, we have the vertebral bodies of C4 to 7 in the cervical spine and T1 in the thoracic spine. Coming from T1, we have the first rib, and sitting roughly over the top of this, we have the clavicle, also known as the collarbone. The clavicle articulates with the acromion of the scapula, which is sometimes called the shoulder blade. And the scapula articulates with the head of the humerus at the glenohumeral or shoulder joint. The two important muscles to note are the middle and anterior scalenes. And finally, between these, we have the main artery to the arm, which is known as the axillary artery in this region. The axillary artery runs between the middle and anterior scalenes and deep to the clavicle. Now, let's reintroduce the brachial plexus. We can see that it emerges, like the axillary artery, from between the middle and anterior scalene muscles. It also passes, like the axillary artery, deep to the clavicle. This close relationship to the axillary artery is crucial in identifying and defining the structure of the brachial plexus. The most common way to divide up the brachial plexus is to chop it into five segments. These are largely academic, but they're helpful when learning it for the first time. These segments are the roots, trunks, divisions, cords, and branches. They can be remembered using the mnemonic Read That Damn Cadaver Book. Now, let's take a closer look at these five segments. The roots arise from the anterior rami of C5, C6, C7, C8, and most of T1. They pass between the middle and anterior scalenes to enter the posterior triangle of the neck. The five roots coalesce into three trunks, with C5 and C6 forming the superior trunk, C7 the middle trunk, and C8 and T1 the inferior trunk. The trunks pass over rib 1 to enter the axilla. Next, the trunks branch and join into anterior and posterior divisions, with the posterior divisions shown darker here. All three trunks contribute to the posterior division, the superior and middle produce one anterior division, and the inferior produces its own anterior division. The anterior divisions will go on to supply the anterior compartment of the arm and forearm, and the posterior divisions will supply the posterior compartments. The cords are described based on their relationship to the axillary artery, so we have lateral, posterior and medial cords. These are simply the short nerve segments that are produced by the divisions. Finally, the cords give rise to several terminal branches, which go on to do most of the work in the arm and forearm. Let's take a closer look at these terminal branches. We have five in total, each carrying out a major role downstream. They are the ulna, median, radial, musculocutaneous, and axillary nerves. We'll cover each of these in a lot more detail later on in this series, but for now, let's just make sure we remember their names and origins. An easy way to remember the names when drawing them from this perspective is using the mnemonic, you must revise more anatomy, with U for ulnar nerve, M for median nerve, R for radial nerve, M for musculocutaneous nerve, and A for axillary nerve. The other thing that you should know at this point is what nerve roots contribute to each terminal nerve. The easiest way to learn this is by following these roots from their origins to their terminal branches. 
First we had the axillary nerve, which receives contributions only from the uppermost part of the brachial plexus, C5 and C6. Next, the musculocutaneous nerve receives contributions from the upper three roots, C5, C6 and C7. The greedy radial nerve receives contributions from all five roots, C5, C6, C7, C8 and D1. The median nerve has roots in all but the uppermost part of the brachial plexus, C6, C7, C8 and T1. And finally, the ulna nerve receives only the lowest two roots, C8 and T1. OK, we're done with the main bit. For completion's sake, I'm going to blast through every other nerve that arises from the brachial plexus. Some are very important and others have relatively minor roles, but we'll cover them all here so you can get the full picture. From the roots, we have the dorsal scapula and long thoracic nerve. From the superior trunk, we have the suprascapular nerve and nerve to the subclavius. From the lateral cord, we have the lateral pectoral nerve. From the posterior cord, we have the superior and inferior subscapular nerves and the thoracodorsal nerve. And finally, from the medial cord, we have the medial pectoral nerve and the medial cutaneous nerves of the arm and forearm. So, returning to Mike, Herb's palsy describes a damage to the upper two roots of the brachial plexus. The most common cause of this is traumatic birth injury, for example when forceps are used during a breech delivery. The terminal nerves most affected are the musculocutaneous, axillary, suprascapular and nerve to the subclavius. The patient typically presents with an internally rotated arm with the fingers pointed backwards in a position known as the waiter's tip. The patient may also have sensory loss on the lateral arm. Most children recover quickly with physiotherapy, but those more severely affected may have irreversible damage which can have significant impact on their quality of life. And there we go. That's the entirety of the brachial plexus covered in six minutes. Like the video and subscribe to our channel if you found it useful, and leave a comment down below with what you'd like to see us cover next. Have a great day.